I never sing that last song that I don't think about some of the places in this world I've been at certain times that uh, that song didn't come to mind. <laughs> And so far in my travels, and I imagine I've done about the most of them, at least in this world, I don't have to worry about that much anymore. But one particular time, I remember in particular being in Pakistan, the back of a pickup truck, got going down the road. And I asked the other fellow that was back there with me, I said, do you know where we're going? <laughs> he said, no, don't. <laughs> I said, well, I hope they know where we're going. <laughs> but anyway, I knew, God knew, and we made it just fine. If you open your Bible, Romans 1, and you know part of that chapter deals with the Gentiles as a whole host of people who walked away from God, did not want to retain God in their knowledge. But I want us to look at where Paul finishes in verses 16 and 17 about the importance of the gospel when he says in verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein, that means in the gospel, is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. But now notice the transition in the next verse of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth and unrighteousness because that which may be known of God is manifest in them for God hath showed it unto them and then he goes ahead and talks about basically uh, the laws of nature and so forth and everything there is about us points to God the point I want to make this morning is that after he tells about the gospel, which is God's power to save us from sin, immediately he says the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth and unrighteousness. We know Peter said to Christians in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9 that regarding the Lord's second coming, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, were not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. We are in a probationary state in this Christian age. We have an opportunity on this earth to prove to God we love Him, that we'll have faith in Him and His gospel, and that we will obey Him, that we will follow His will. Or we will show Him this world means more to me than anything else. Now, a person doesn't have to be an outright atheist before he can be lost. Jesus dealt with plenty of religious people who were very zealous for God who were as lost as they could be. Paul even said of his own Jews according to the flesh, for I bear them record they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. So it's obvious you can be very zealous for God, but if you pursue him contrary to the knowledge, then... It's not going to do you very much good. You'll end up crucifying the very Savior you claim to be looking for. So we need to know that the wrath of God is coming. And it's coming because of ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. The truth of God is on this earth. The truth of salvation is on this earth in the Bible, in the gospel. The church has the charge to preach the gospel to every creature. In fact, what we overlook sometimes is that while the church is charged to do that, Mark 16, 15, Paul tells us as he preaches on Mars Hill in Athens that God is not far from any one of us. God wants to be found. But you see, when he made each of us free moral agents, then we have to make up our mind that we want to look for God. We want to do what's necessary to find God and then to submit to God, to receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save our souls. Now, we have the power in this life to reject God and do as we please. Or we can use this life to find God, 
to learn the gospel, to believe it, to obey it, and serve God. Now, why? Because the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth and unrighteousness. So I want to talk a little while about the very wrath of God. In the warped and twisted thinking of today's world, even among those who claim to believe in God, who claim to love God and the Christ, who recognize maybe the Bible to be the Word of God, it is unacceptable to them, to many of them, to speak about a God that will destroy people for their sins. But if this were the only verse in the Bible about the wrath of God and to whom it will be revealed someday, that would be sufficient. God does not have to repeat himself over and over to make what he says binding upon each one of us and thereby very important. You know the world frowns on the thought of anger and vengeance and righteous indignation. Unless, unless one is angry with God and God's word and God's people, that's permissible. That's encouraged. To make light of God and the Bible and God's people, those who follow the Bible, that's perfectly all right. Although such is the case with worldly people, the Bible makes it exceedingly clear that God has been can be, and will be to some, a God of wrath and anger and vengeance. Now, as we've studied over the weeks in the Minor Prophets with Ken as our teacher, he has pointed out numerous times from the prophets, the Minor Prophets as we call them, that section of the Old Testament, about God punishing his own people. But you'll notice also he punished the pagan nations round about his people, even though he would use some of those pagan nations to punish an unfaithful people of Israel. Well, what is very interesting here is that when you go back to man being punished because he sinned in the beginning and cast out of the garden and kept away from the tree of life in the midst of the garden, then you come down to the time of the flood where man's mind was only on evil continually, and God decided to destroy everybody, save Noah and his family, gave them the plan of salvation from the flood for that day, building the ark and so forth. Then as you come through, you have the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. You have God using the Israelites as his instrument to destroy the wicked, vile Canaanites off the land because their time of proving they would love God and keep his commandments had run out. It's important to understand as you see these things, as you come on down even to the New Testament with the destruction, although it's not recorded in the New Testament, of Jerusalem and the Jews by the Romans in AD 70, that every one of those judgments brought about by God, such as Nebuchadnezzar destroying Judah and the Assyrians, the northern kingdom of Israel, was saying there is coming an ultimate, final, and complete judgment of everybody. We should recognize that is the fundamental message of all of these punishments that are recorded, especially in the Old Testament. So while he judges different ones at different times, they have already proven to a long-suffering God we're not going to do what you tell us. And there is an end to that long suffering. God's long suffering ran out with the world when the flood was brought to destroy all those people. God's long suffering ran out with Sodom and Gomorrah. We're told by Jesus no man knows when the world's going to end. God knows. I can only guess based upon how God dealt with Sodom and Gomorrah, how he dealt with the people before the flood and in the flood, that the world is going to have to reach a stage to where God in his infinite wisdom, knowing the heart of every person, 
that this is as far as it goes. There is no use giving them any more time. I sometimes think, is God thinking that right now? And he's designated tomorrow at 10 o'clock as far as our time is concerned to where he's going to say to his son, go bring my people home and eject the judgment. Because he's already said he's made his son to be the judge. And we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ, give an account of the deeds done in the body, whether good or bad. Nobody can escape that. But while the world opposes that part of the gospel, or maybe all of it, but especially that part that says God is a God of vengeance and wrath. He even said, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Christians need not be ashamed of that God. He's the same God that loved us and gave His only begotten Son that we might have life. The gospel is what we have and made us what we are. The gospel makes us Christians when we love it and from the heart obey it. The gospel keeps us faithfully when we live as it teaches Christians are to live. And though the world may despise the message, it's the only hope of the world. And because the world despises it and opposes it and makes light, even persecuting physically those who preach it and live it, that's no excuse not to teach it and not to defend it. The truth about the gospel is the truth about God and His wrath as well as everything else that's contained in it that is for the good of man. So we must preach it. Regardless of what people say, people must be warned that indeed God will be vindicated someday. The American Heritage Dictionary defines the term wrath, W-R-A-T-H, as follows. First of all, forceful, often vindictive anger. Second definition, punishment or vengeance as a manifestation of anger. And the B definition under that is divine retribution for sin. It's pretty plain. The word wrath occurs some 194 times in the King James Version of the Bible. And the word anger occurs 228 times. Now, at times, those words are used because men have been full of anger or full of wrath, and they've been wrong in being that way. But nevertheless, it's there. In many of the instances, it is God who is angry. It is God who is full of wrath toward man. And such descriptions of God need not be overlooked as we seek to understand who God is. But we need to examine them, and we need to understand them. They are as much a part of the gospel and good for us in keeping ourselves on God's side as anything I can think of. Notice Hebrews 3 in verse 11, and if you followed the scripture reading this morning, you've already run across this. God said concerning the children of Israel who sinned and would not repent as they wandered, so I swear in my wrath they shall not enter into my rest. Now he was trying to teach members of the church who were Jews that because of persecution you're about to go back under the law of Moses. Well, have you ever considered, as he might say to them, what happened to those who were disobedient under the law of Moses? And they didn't even say how much worse is it going to be since you're under such a greater and better high priest and law if you decide to spurn that and live on your own. Notice verse 12. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. What then is our duty to one another to help each other be as faithful as one can be? But exhort one another, he says in verse 13. Do it daily while you have the time, while it's called today. Lest any of you 
be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Now, this was written to Christians. This is written because God loves us. This is written to those who heard, believed, and from the heart obeyed the gospel that the Lord added to the church. But they were letting things into their mind contrary to being steadfast, unmovable, abounding in the work of the Lord. They were about to actually give up the whole New Testament system. Just, if you please, rip the New Testament out of your Bible and let's just live like we used to live as Jews and approach God and the law of Moses. Then we won't have the unbelieving Jews after us. They, they won't won't be upset with us. It's hard to believe people think that way. But I've seen people in the church today over the years of my preaching who have become so burdened down and they have forgotten maybe proper prayer and proper Bible study and encouragement in worship and they just let things wear them out because they're, they can't see it far off. They've lost the eye of faith. They're only seeing what's burdened them down now. They can only see the cross they bear. They don't see that if you bear it right, as the Word teaches, heaven's your home because you bear it. And so they begin to give up. They begin to slack off. This kind of thing happens. We better listen to these things. So why would God be full of anger and full of wrath? So I think finding the answer to that question can help us. You already know it's not any mystifying, difficult thing to understand. The very first thing we've already answered, the wrath of God is caused by man's sin. We need to have the proper respect, awe, and understanding how terrible man's sin is in God's sight. We talk about the God of love, and a lot of times we confuse that and don't know really what it means. But think about God being the God of justice. God is much a God of justice as He is a God of love. I think you will see if you really study the attributes of God, they all complement one another, and you couldn't have one without the other, and none of them could work together without each one working properly. Listen to Genesis 6, 5 through 6. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented of the Lord that he had made man on earth, and it grieved him at his heart. Now that last sentence is speaking on our level of understanding. We've had things happen to us after we put all sorts of work and effort into it, prayer, and it does not work out. Not for anything we left undone or things we did that was wrong, but because other people just plainly didn't appreciate it or care. And you can see how you become grieved and say, uh, all that work and effort I put in on it and they cared nothing about it. Well, if you let that go on, of course, it can wear you down rather than realize we're just sowers of the seed. And they've got to take it out of a loving heart and believe it and obey it. I can't do that for them. But the Lord is going to reach a stage someday like he did before the flood with this whole system. And Peter tells us what's going to happen then. This old world and all material things will be burned up with fervent heat. The earth also and the works of their end shall be burned up. The elements will melt with fervent heat. This whole system of existence and the way it works will not be here any longer. It was because of man's sin that God destroyed the earth with a great flood. As I said earlier, when you see God exercising his judgment to judge his people or any other nation, then that's just a signal that someday there'll be a final and complete judgment at the end of this whole material system where everybody will be brought into judgment. His wrath was then present in the beginning as you read your Bible. And it's going to be present in the end. And again, in response to man's 
sinfulness. The book of Revelation says of Christ, who's the executor of God's vengeance. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Revelation 19.15. We have the king at the right hand of God ruling through his last will and testament. Colossians 3.17. We are to act on the basis of the authority of our Lord and King, for we're citizens in His kingdom, the church, the family of God. But there's that day coming, as I've said several times already, when He will not be the Lamb, meek, lowly, kind, forgiving, saying, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I'm meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest in your souls. But he's coming as the lion of the tribe of Judah, with one thing in mind, to judge the world in righteousness. Now, if you're not found faithful in Christ, or having, before he came, died faithful in Christ, <clears throat> then all that will be found for that person is the wrath of God. So when all said and done, God's wrath is not His fault. It's the fault of those who transgress God's law and who turn their back on the forgiveness God has offered through Christ and His gospel. The wrath of God is also caused by as I said, and this all ties together, the offensiveness of transgressing God's law of sin. If we just understood, and I, and I think all my life I've tried to grasp it more and more, how heinous sin is when it comes to a righteous God. Yet His love is there, and when we sinned, He made a provision for us to where He could extend His favor in the merciful gospel to us for a time period. <clears throat> as I said in the beginning, as Peter wrote, the Lord's not slack concerning his promise to return. Some men count slackness, but his long suffer does work. But God's character is such that he is holy. He's righteous. He's pure. Peter deals with that in 1 Peter 1, 15 through 16. We need to also, in understanding the God that is our Heavenly Father, that He is pure. We sing a song sometimes that reflects upon our own thinking and what we let go on in our minds. Pure in heart, O oh God, help me to be, that I, Thy holy face, someday may see. So we need to know then that God is against because He is pure and righteous and holy. What is not holy? What is unrighteous? What is corrupt? What is offensive to His very being, the essence of what He is? Consider Psalm 106, verse 40. The psalmist said, Therefore was the wrath of the Lord kindled against the people insomuch that he abhorred his own inheritance. So the Lord had already explained in Exodus 23 through 5, explained to Israel that idolatry was offensive to him, but they persisted in it. And those of you that had been listening to the study and participating in the Minor Prophets, that's what you heard over and over again. It's coming. Repent while you can. It's coming. I suggest you read Jeremiah with that in mind because he's in the last days of Jerusalem in the city besieged by Nebuchadnezzar. The first captivity has already been carried away and Ezekiel is over in Babylon saying, you're here for a while. Build your houses and settle down. You're not going back. There's 70 long years you're going to be here and it's your own fault. And Jeremiah's over there in the last day of Jerusalem saying, don't fight anymore. God has allowed them to do this. In other words, take you to the woodshed for a good tanning. 
And of course, they accused him of not being patriotic because he was saying, surrender. Well, surrender to what? Well, it's God's will, those Babylonians right there besieging Jerusalem. And it's his will they're out there because you wouldn't obey him. Prophet after prophet after prophet was sent to them. You didn't even value what happened to the northern kingdom, your sister, as it were. When God punished them and allowed the Assyrians to take them away. You're not learning anything. This is the end. Don't you know there is no repentance on your part? Even if you acknowledge that all this is wrong and you repent in your mind, you're going into captivity. And there would be some good people going to captivity along with those wicked people. Remember Daniel? It's interesting that Daniel and the three Hebrew children, that's when their lights shine brightest. It's when they're taken away with all the rest. But there's no indication they were rebellious in all this time. So sometimes things come upon us and they allow us, because of those things happening to us, to shine forth as lights for God that we wouldn't have but it hadn't been in those situations. Israel's sin, it was idolatry and all the attendant evils connected with it, offended God and He became angry with them. God's wrath is a righteous thing. And he ultimately is going to execute his wrath upon sinful man because the wicked cannot go unpunished. God would not be a just God if he allowed the wicked to go unpunished. In 2 Thessalonians 1, 6 through 9, this is written to Christians. They're persecuted by worldly people as they labor to preach the gospel, defend it, and live it in their lives. And so these words of comfort come as part of that which would make up the New Testament. Seeing that it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. Now think about that for a minute. It is a righteous thing that God is going to punish those that persecute you. Then he tells them, and to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. What is their end? Who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and the glory of His power? The next verse says, when He comes to be glorified in His saints. You see, the faithful child of God looks at the second coming of Christ as freedom, complete Reward, eternal, glorified reward. But not so for those who reject the counsel of God, who seek to live as it suits them. So in this passage, we see that God's wrath flows directly from the fact that He is righteous and that He is a just God. We should not, therefore, study the love of God is if that's one God. You know, the old moderns in the 19th century tried to say, well, there's the wrathful, vengeful God of the Old Testament, and then there's the loving God of the New Testament. He's the same God. Brother Warren wrote a book. It's still available. The Lion Who Is a Lamb. I think that's right. Maybe the Lamb Who's a Lion. Now think about that for a minute. Jesus, meek and lowly. But there were a few times in his earthly ministry when he didn't appear to be so meek and lowly. And those people there in the temple when they were selling their doves and their bullocks and their money changing was going on, I imagine they really looked at him. I saw somebody who was really trying to get at this false idea that God will never punish anybody. He said, just remember, Jesus was known to take a whip and run everybody out of the temple. He said, you better think about that. And that's the Jesus who loved us to the uttermost and gave himself for us. But he's righteous. The zeal of my house, he said, hath eaten me up. It's important to be right with God and zealous and fervent over those things that are godly. Justice demands that some penalty be paid by those who commit wickedness and die unforgiven. 
And for those who will not accept God's generous offer of payment via the death of Christ on the cross, extended to us through his power to save us in the gospel, there's going to have to be some other form of payment made. And it's never ending. It's forever. Romans 6, 23, we're very familiar with, for the wages of sin is death. That's eternal separation from God and all that pertains to God. Right now in this world, very wicked people enjoy many blessings that we enjoy. The rain falls on the just and the unjust also. But when a person gets to hell after the day of judgment, all influence of God completely is withdrawn. You don't want to serve him here. You don't want to retain him in your mind here. You don't want to seek after him here. Well, there's a place prepared for you where he'll be nowhere around and none of his influence will be there. God is a God of justice. Then the wrath of God needs to be considered along with his great goodness. There are two things that will motivate a person to be sorry toward his God for the sins he's committed against him. One of them is realizing just what a terrible thing it is to sin against God and where that sin is going to lead you ultimately if you don't get forgiveness of it and obedience of the gospel while you're on this earth. That's what we've been studying about concerning God's justice and his righteousness and the wrath that flows therefrom toward all those who die in sin. But the other is the goodness of God. Paul wrote that to the church in Rome in Romans eleven twenty two. Behold therefore the goodness and severity of God. It's ridiculous to talk about the love of God and not talk about the severity of God. The Holy Spirit through Paul said they both ought to be talked about. They're the same God. If we are in the love of God, we need not be concerned about the wrath of Almighty God. Except we who have enjoyed His redemption and are faithful to Him should be sounding out to everybody else, now is the time to obey the gospel. Today's the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. If we are not on God's side, obedient to Him, faithful members of his church. We need to be beware greatly. We ought to be trembling right now because we'll see God's wrath and that's something I would never want to even see from afar off us this experience. The writer of Hebrews said it this way, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Now that wasn't written <laughs> to those Christians who were in the process of departing from Jesus to give them any comfort at all. Put it this way, it was written to scare them to death. Now when we see the gospel move people to repentance, it'll be because they see the end of their ungodly lives or it will be because they see the great goodness of God that's intervened in Christ and he's made the way for forgiveness possible. Jesus suffered, bled, and died on the cross as a sinless being. Therefore, he could die for you and for me and all mankind. He shed his blood for the remission of our sin to purchase the church. That when we're baptized into Christ, we contact the saving blood of Christ. And we are in the grace of God as we walk faithful before him in the church to which he adds us. To enjoy the favor of God. I like to think sometimes, feeble though it may be, that when we stand before God at the judgment, let's just suppose old Satan's over here, and he's saying, wait now, I remember when this man did this and that and left this undone, because he's certainly not going to bring up the good things, good as the Bible defines good, about any one of us. But Jesus could actually stand there and say, he from the heart heard the gospel, loved it and obeyed it, and my blood covers him. He stands uncondemned. So what's Satan going to do? Well, I'll tell you what he'll do. He'll enter right into torment in the place prepared for the devil and his angels. But not those who have sought refuge in Christ. Not those who are faithful to him. Now that will give comfort to all in this world's crying out for that. Just look at the people that are miserable 
They're not happy with themselves. They're not happy with anything. They're down on everything. It's because they're caught up in themselves. Everything's got to circulate around me. And me leads me away from God. It It leads me away from doing God's will, which means helping others and being concerned about their plight. It's all me, me, me. And they're miserable. And they seek happiness in all sorts of ways. But the happiness to be found in this life is found in the gospel and our obedience to it and our constant efforts to live like the New Testament says as God's children. So the wrath of God, that's one thing we do not have to experience if we will but obey the gospel and live the Christian life. So we close the lesson saying to anybody here today that's not a Christian, you need to believe that Christ is the Son of God. Repent of your sins, confess your faith in Him, and be buried with your Lord in baptism, baptized for the remission of sins. Raised to walk in newness of life, to live faithful to Him until the time of your existence here is no more. As a child of God, have you wandered? Have you, have you let the wrath of God sort of slink back in the back and you've moved further away, not thinking God is a God of wrath, that God is a God of righteousness, God is a just God. No, let's be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know, your labor is not in vain in the Lord, First Corinthians 15, 58. Any sins that are there, repent of them, confess them, and pray God for forgiveness. So if you're subject to the Lord's great invitation, we invite you to come while we stand and while we sit.